Hello, my name is Jean Ann Encorvia. Today I will present our group's work on lateral inhibition in magnetic domain wall racetrack arrays for neuromorphic computing. This work was done in my research group at the University of Texas at Austin and in collaboration with um, Professor Joseph Friedman at UT Dallas and um, Chris and Matt at Sandia National Laboratory. We will start with motivating why magnetic devices are attractive for artificial neural networks and motivating why we are designing leaky integrate and fire neurons with these magnetic devices and especially with lateral inhibition behavior. We will then discuss our simulation results on two neuron lateral inhibition and winner take all in neuron arrays and then conclude the talk. There are problems with traditional computing when performing data intensive tasks, which have motivated us to look to new types of computing for solving these issues. The first problem is that computing has a memory wall where for data intensive um, tasks such as genome sequencing, memory access can dominate as much as 96% of the computing time. We also find that um, there is high energy loss when computers are idle. For example, SRAM idle leakage can consume 20% of the total power. There is also another um, energy bottleneck when we convert from analog to digital information, which can consume as much as 70% of active power. And this is especially a problem for Internet of Things applications or real-time learning applications where we want to interact with the environment and then send that data to the cloud. So uh, we can see through the trends over time that reduction in energy per computation going forward is really going to have to come from new materials and new architectures. So these new materials and architectures include neuromorphic computing, analog computing, quantum computing, reversible computing, uh, and also then new materials such as low dimensional materials and magnetic materials. So it's really the combination of uh, new materials and then how we can better use these materials in computing that can lead to innovation to um, keep decreasing the energy per mathematical computation as we move forward. So one of the major uh, driving forces in this area is called neuromorphic computing and it takes inspiration from the way the human brain works since the human brain is very efficient at certain data intensive tasks. For example, the brain can recognize a face with a million times less power than modern supercomputers. And why is this? It's because firstly, memory is distributed with the processing. Memory and logic are densely connected together and computing is done in a parallel rather than a serial manner. This brings us then to um, the basic building blocks of a neuromorphic computer, which are artificial neurons and synapses that emulate the neurons and synapses of the brain. So this is a cartoon of um, neurons where there is a presynaptic sending cell or a presynaptic neuron that will fire and is connected to a postsynaptic receiving neuron. And that connection point, is, the strength of the connection is determined by a synapse, um, which tells us how much those two neurons are connected or not connected together. So we need artificial neurons and synapses that have functionalities like those in the brain that aid in this energy efficient computing that we see the brain is able to do for certain tasks. And we need to think about how we're gonna connect them together. So why look to the magnetic materials? There are many reasons that magnetic materials are an attractive candidate for artificial neurons and synapses. Firstly, uh, compared to other resistive uh, memory elements, they have low right energy and right time. They're also non-volatile, so it removes this leakage problem and allows in-memory computing. There are some practical uh, reasons, such as back end of the line compatibility, where they're compatible with CMOS transistor fabrication. They have radiation hardness, which is uh, important for extreme environment applications. And uh, the focus of today's talk is on the complex features that magnetic materials can have that can be mapped onto these systems. Uh, and we're particularly looking at um, domain wall dynamics, oscillatory behavior, and magnetic stray field interactions that these materials and therefore these devices provide. 
So the current state of the art of magnetic neuromorphic computing, it's an exploding field. Um, there's been work on spin torque oscillators for speech recognition, stochastic magnetic tunnel junctions, um, synapses with domain walls, and um, synapses and neurons with all spin neural network type domain walls. So the type of neuron that we are focused on in this work is called leaky integrate and fire neuron. And the behavior you want to capture looks like this graph here, where uh, if a constant current is applied to our artificial neuron, then if we look at the voltage signal of the neuron, it's going to integrate over some time until we reach a threshold voltage at which it'll fire and um, then, then be reset. If we get a pulse of input current, then we'll see integrating, and then when we take away the input pulse, we want to see leaking or relaxing of our neuron such that if it's not getting um, activated, it'll relax on its own back to its original state. And then we additionally want a feature called lateral inhibition, which uh, is the focus of this talk. And uh, this is a behavior seen in the brain where if one neuron is getting stimulated more than its neighbors, if it's winning out, then it can actually suppress the behavior of the nearby neighbors and therefore allow that winning neuron to fire and the ones that are not winning out to not fire. And this is very important in um, helping um, reduce errors in the brain and have the neuron that's supposed to fire actually fire. It leads to what's called a winner take all. So lateral inhibition is very important to learning and is usually implemented through bulky peripheral circuitry in artificial implementations. So um, for example, this is a CMOS winner take all circuitry um, that here requires five transistors per neuron. So you can imagine as we increase the number of neurons, this can quickly increase the number of additional transistors that were needed to implement this lateral inhibition. Um, but this particular paper shows the benefits of doing lateral inhibition in our um, artificial neural networks. So here, um, the ve ve vector matrix multiply uh, with winner-take-all was roughly equal to a one-layer neural network in certain complexity, but with the computing power of a two-layer neural network. So um, it, doubled the, it effectively doubled the number of layers in the neural network by having this additional lateral inhibition ability. So we can see here that um, if we could have device inherent lateral inhibition behavior, it would drastically reduce the circuitry and therefore it would drastically increase energy efficiency both by having the lateral inhibition feature and by uh, not having all these additional transistors to accomplish it. So uh, we have been working on domain wall magnetic tunnel junctions that can act as both synapses and neurons. This is a side view cartoon of the domain wall magnetic tunnel junction. It has a um, ferromagnetic layer made of cobalt iron boron with a domain wall in it, which is a transition region between magnetic domains, and a uh, tunnel junction in the center such that the domain wall can be various positions past the tunnel junction and have an analog, res analog resistance output. Um, in the neuron instantation of the domain wall magnetic tunnel junction, we have a smaller magnetic tunnel junction in the center that's offset to one side. And when the domain wall moves along in the cobalt iron borne track, we get integration. And when it passes the tunnel junction, we get firing. And uh, leaking can happen through um, any kind of internal or external fields that will set the domain wall back to one side. Um, these these three magnetic tunnel junctions can be set up as a neural network crossfire array, uh, while the neurons will be on the periphery and the synapses in between. So um, just to summarize the previous work in this area, we've looked at um, showing this um, leak integrated fire behavior in these three wall magnetic tunnel junctions, uh, as shown as this uh, picture here where you can look at the domain wall position over time when the current is applied the domain wall translates across the wire and then here um, we use an external field to then slowly reset the domain wall for the leaking behavior which can also be uh, implemented field free using anisotropy or shape gradients. 
So the lateral inhibition in these devices is implemented through many nice stray field interactions uh, set up like this cartoon here, where we have many of these artificial uh, duodenal magnetunnel tunnel junction neurons set up side by side. And for example, here the center neuron is winning out and therefore suppressing the nearby drain walls. Um, so this was initially seen in our initial experiments for um, very small neuron spacing. And by better understanding what's going on, we were able to actually very much optimize this inhibition behavior. So um, the magnetic stray field is what's going to um, create this lateral inhibition effect. And this is exciting because um, usually for traditional memory applications, we want to suppress the stray fields that are interacting with our MRAM devices. But here we're actually making use of the stray field um, for, um, for the device behavior. So um, here is an example of showing how the lateral inhibition works where, um, so this is a picture up top. Let me, so here we have um, neuron one with its dream wall here and neuron N with its dream wall head. And this magnetic, um, upwards pointing magnetic domain here is going to create stray field that's going to impede the motion of this domain wall in the neighbor. And so we can see that in the simulation results done using MUMAX. Um, so if we include a lot of inhibition behavior, then when neuron one is ahead, neuron two gets this far along its track. If we don't have a lot of inhibition behavior, then so neuron one did not get ahead. Neuron one, we can put no current in, so it never was ahead of the other one. Then neuron two, we can see its stream wall has moved farther. So this is evidence that we're able to, in this lateral inhibition condition, prevent the dream wall from moving as far in the neighbor. So this two neuron interaction was at first observed in our simulations only for very narrow spacing. Um, for example, we used a 32 nanometer wide wires with six nanometers of spacing between two neurons. And here you can clearly see this behavior where um, this is a plot of the velocity of neuron two's domain wall as neuron one's current density increases. So as neuron one gets ahead of neuron two, we see the neuron two domain wall velocity decreasing here from 72 to 56 meters per second. Um, but um, this left us wondering, is this only going to occur in very narrow wires? 32 nanometers is quite narrow. Uh, and is it only occur in very narrow spacing? But what we, de what we determined is that um, by better understanding the, how the stray field is interacting with the dream one walls, that we can um, tune this lateral emission behavior and increase it almost to completely stop the, the dream wall in the inhibited neuron. So. Um, we see here that the maximum lateral inhibition happens when the stray field from the neighbor dream wall um, fixes the dream wall angle of the inhibited neuron just below Walker breakdown. So Walker breakdown is the point at which the dream wall tilt angle um, starts to traverse as it moves, starts to rotate as the dream wall traverses. Uh, so in this plot, we use a width of 50 nanometer wide wires with 1.5 nanometer thick cobalt iron boron materials. And current is applied to send um, Dwayne Wall 2 above Walker breakdown. And the straight field either assists Walker breakdown or brings the Wall below Walker breakdown to a fixed angle. So um, we can see in this plot, the dotted line is the non-inhibited motion if we don't include lateral inhibition. And this is Dwayne Wall's 2 velocity as we increase the wire spacing between the two wires. And so when, this, when the wires are very narrowly spaced together, below 80 nanometers, we're in this processional regime where the field is really strong. We're above Walker breakdown. And so this blue dot is plotted here in terms of the wall position versus time. And we see it rotating as it moves. It's above Walker breakdown. Uh, and then above 90 nanometers is where we're in a steady field, uh, where Dream wall 2's position versus time looks like this. And so um, by tuning to a particular spacing, we actually get this sweet spot where the animal 2's velocity is sent very small and we're able to highly inhibit its motion. This inhibition can be tuned by the neuron spacing as we saw. Um, so in this left plot, we're looking at the drain wall position versus time um, for inhibited compared to if there's no inhibition. 
for, for four different spacings. So um, when spacing is 30 nanometers, we don't see much difference between the inhibited and non-inhibited. Uh, and we get a large difference at 90 nanometers and then uh, less of a difference at 120 nanometers spacing. And so um, in this right plot then, we look at the normal velocity versus wire spacing. And we can convert that to a lateral inhibition parameter which is defined as the difference between the velocities divided by the non-inhibited velocity times 100%. And so again, comparing no inhibition versus including inhibition in our simulation, um, we can see that um, we get up to 75% lateral inhibition at this 90 nanometer spacing for these particular material parameters. And so to further delve into um, this, what's happening in terms of being below or above walker breakdown, uh, this phi can define the angle of the drain wall spins as, or the drain wall magnetic moment as it's propagating along the wire. And um, the velocity depends on phi um, given by these equations here. This is the velocity below walker breakdown and the velocity above walker breakdown, where MS is the saturation magnetization and NX and NY are the, anis um, the anisotropy constants. And so um, one way to visualize this is in, in this bottom left plot where we're looking at the domain wall velocity at the different tilt angles uh, of the domain wall. And um, we can see then when it's above walker breakdown, we're in this black regime where it's, it's moving through all the tilt angles as it rotates, as it moves. And then for the different spacings, we are setting the tilt angle um, to a certain tilt angle, for example, between um, 90 nanometers is at this minimum tilt angle here, up to 150 nanometers here. And um, so this is what enables us to either efficiently or not efficiently move the domain wall due to the tilt angle, which is set by its neighbor through inhibition. Uh, so we can visualize this further by looking at the domain wall velocity versus external field coming from the neighbors. And we see that actually, um, we get a minimum and a maximum in the domain wall velocity. And thus, we can tune the spacing to either inhibit or excite the neighbors. So we can either have lateral inhibition or lateral excitation. And these minimum and maximum fields uh, depend on the material's parameters, including the anisotropy and the damping parameters and the um, current density. So as we can see from those equations, that we can further increase the, the lateral inhibition by um, tuning the saturation magnetization and spacing uh, versus width. Uh, so here, we look at three different saturation magnetizations and also at the wire width, and we can achieve above 90% lateral inhibition in the 30 nanometer wide wires by using the correct saturation magnetization. Uh, and over here, we also see how um, by choosing the anisotropy constant, we can also increase the lateral inhibition for a given wire spacing. There are additional materials parameters that can come into play. For example, the Gislancy Mori interaction um, can also tune this interaction. So we can um, set the minimum and maximum field required to either imp impede or enhance the dream wall motion, and it, it depends highly on the DMI factor as well. So this is another material parameter that we can use. So um, we were able to show up to 90% lateral inhibition in paired neuron arrays, uh, but we were interested in what happens if we have an array of these neurons like we'd expect in an actual neural network layer. And um, so here we have an array, and we can see that um, in these bottom plots, we have three neurons side by side. We have a center neuron, and then we have the neuron on either side. And depending on how they're spaced, we can either have weak or strong lateral inhibition of the center neuron. And um, what we've looked at is, is um, by actually having paired neurons, so we have narrow spacing between two, and then a wider spacing, and then narrow spacing. So the, the spacing between two neurons, S1, is for example 60 nanometers and then there's a, a larger spacing of 110 nanometers before the next pair of neurons and we simulated an array of a thousand of these side-by-side -side neurons in this paired way 
and um, we can see here clearly that we get a soft winner take all behavior where the dream wall velocity contrast is enhanced due to inhibition, or only the more active neurons will be able to fire, and the less active neurons are the ones that are going to be inhibited. So here we look at the dream wall velocity versus rank up to all thousand of these neurons. Uh, the intrinsic velocity, it looks like the blue curve, and then the inhibitive velocity, you can see that the very fast neurons are all moving at the same speed as they were if we didn't include inhibition, but the slow neurons get their dream wall velocity decreased. So in conclusion, um, dream wall magnetonal junction based magnetic devices capture um, leaky inner gate fire and intrinsic lateral inhibition, uh, and this is similar to the behavior of biological neurons. And understanding the stray field interaction physics leads to optimization of lateral inhibition up to 90%. And it can be tuned by device and material parameters. And in arrays, these dream wall tunnel junction neurons show soft winner take all, which can be used for energy efficient learning applications. I'd like to acknowledge the students, including especially Asan, who uh, led this work as the graduate student on the project, and our collaborators. So I will end with the conclusions slide here. And uh, please, you're welcome to email me. My email is down below here uh, for more information or to follow up with more discussion on this topic. Thank you for listening to my talk.